everyone, Cream right here today. We have Scott Resendez, who is the CEO and co-founder of the Soccer Syndicate. Scott, how's it going? Going great. How are you doing? Good, Cream. good. It's going good. Thanks for joining us today. No problem, my, my pleasure. Yeah. I just want to drop this on the record of like how we met back uh, last month in Kentucky um, during the USL mid-year event. It was, it was nice to run in you at that time. And, and now we're building our relationship through, uh, through Zoom. And now we're mm -hmm. here for the interview. So it's awesome to have you on. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. So can you take us back in time and how you got involved into the beautiful game? Sure. Uh, let's see. So I've been involved um, for, for quite a long time. My first uh, involvement was actually on the women's side, um, working for the Washington Freedom uh, here in the area. I was the uh, stats keeper um, for, for matches, and I was the referee liaison and, and locker room liaison for the club um, here in Maryland back in the day. Um, and so that would have been 2002, 2003. Um, and so it was a very small time operation at the, at the time. We only had a, I think they had two or three uh, full-time staff and then everybody else was volunteer like myself. Um, from there, uh, I went and got my master's uh, degree at George Washington University uh, and was doing the sports management program. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that time, uh, I was introduced to some folks starting the MLS Players Association here in Washington, D.C. as well, and uh, was able to interview for that uh, opportunity to be the first full-time staff member there underneath the executive director, um, and so was lucky enough to be selected for that, and that was back uh, World Cup uh, in 06, um, so... So right before then, um, I think 2005, I started um, with the MLS Players Association. So I worked there uh, for quite a while. Um, and that's, that was how I broke into the game. Um, just was, you know, played all my life as a kid and, and, and young adult. Um, knew a lot about the game. And, and that knowledge that I built up uh, kind of catapulted me into the game, I think, because back and the interest wasn't nearly as strong as it is today. So, yeah, for sure, and it's it's growing. Definitely, we got the World Cup coming up, the 2026 World Cup hosted by Canada, U.S., and Mexico, which is exciting. Huge yeah. wave. Um, you also, you know, were with. Wait, are you still with the MLS Player Association? I'm not. No, I left there back uh, in 2009. Well, yeah, I've been gone for quite a long time. Got it. You, you you know, you also have experience with Sporting Kansas City, Energy FC. Um, how did you get into those opportunities and what did you learn from those opportunities? Sure. So I left the Players Association um, and was interested in moving into club side uh, s sports. That was kind of always my interest. Um, you know, the Players Association was, was exciting and, and, and allowed me to build a great contact list in the game. Um, but my interest was always running the club, uh, being involved in, in that side of, of the game. Uh, my first club experience was in Wilmington, North Carolina with the Wilmington Hammerheads, which is now a defunct USL operation. Um, was was hired there as the, the general manager uh, and, and op, uh, president of business. So I ran both the business and, and club side, uh, you know, uh, soccer side of the organization in my first go around with the club, which was exciting, but also incredibly challenging. Um, we had a really small staff um, there, uh, and, and my hands were in absolutely everything every single day. Uh, and we, we fought and clawed um, through, uh, you know, operating a small-time club every single day and all the challenges that came with it. We were incredibly successful. That was season uh, 2012 season. Uh, we made it to the USL final that year. On on, I'm pretty certain the by far the smallest budget in the entire league. Uh, we knocked off number one Orlando City uh, in the in the quarterfinal, um, which was a massive upset. Um, and then stormed to the final, and lost to Ch Charleston. Um, after that season, 
I was approached uh, by Sporting Kansas City to join them uh, as part of their scouting team uh, on the East Coast. So, um, you know, they had regional scouts both on the uh, on the West and the East um, doing college scouting, and so I, I started there in that in that realm uh, and was the East Coast scout for, um, for Sporting Kansas City doing doing college scouting. I ended up staying with them for five and a half years. Um, and in that time, uh, assisted them in the launch of uh, what was their USL affiliate, Oklahoma City Energy. Um, so they they had started their first affiliate was with Orlando, and then they switched their affiliation to Oklahoma City. Um, in doing so, one of their former players uh, was the head coach uh, was was hired as the head coach in Oklahoma, and they asked me to work with him to help him build his his first roster. Um, and, and then subsequent rosters in, in USL. So I had a lot of involvement with that club um, from its inception. And then a few years after they launched, they approached me about coming and being the technical director of the club, uh, which I did. And I did that for uh, about a season and a half um, and then left there and, and launched my company, the Soccer Syndicate. So um, th that's kind of the, the genesis of, of how I've gotten here. Nice, tons of experience before you started up the company soccer syndicates. Why scouting? I know I've asked you this before, but now you know we're on, we're, we're on the interview. It'd be nice to get it on the record of why you chose scouting. Yeah, so you know, as I looked at, you know, it's it's a little bit of an interesting um, kind of way I got here. You know, it's I'm I'm very very atypical club club leader, you know, technical director. I don't have high level playing experience in the game uh, myself. You know, I certainly played for a long time, but, but was not, you know, the greatest player. Um, and so when I joined, you know, when I joined clubs and was working on the, the technical side, I don't think I really ever got much pushback or questioning about my ability to do, to manage paperwork and manage the administration of a club. Um, I think I, I handled all those kind of experiences in spades. Um, but I mean, even to this day, despite all the experience that I had in the game, I think my lack of high level playing experience still begs the question from, from competitors of, you know, how did you learn the game? How do you know, and how do you operate at the level that you do evaluating players and whatnot, having never played. Um, and so the questions have always been there for me with regards to evaluation in that I recognized, you know, even though I was running a club in, in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and, and we were having success, I knew that that question was always going to be there. And when the opportunity to go and, and be a full-time scout for a club came, became available, I took it. Um, and, and I want to be clear, I was a contract, contract employee and only, you know, not a full-time employee of Kansas City. But um, alas, it was important to me to, to beef up that reputation as a scout in this country um, and that there were clubs that that valued the information I provided them um, because I think it was an area that I needed to prove you know clearly that I had that that piece that you know that skill set in my tool bag if you will um, and so from that I put a lot of energy into scouting for a long time you know long before it was really popular or, or are happening quite a bit in this country and it's still really not happening enough but it's happening much more these days you know um when i started again and it would have been 2013 you know scouting was still uh, very much a um nascent you know job experience and there were very few people out there you know pounding the pavement looking for players um and so having had that early early opportunity and that early experience, I think it showed me very clearly that there was a, a, a missing piece there in terms of, um, you know, scouting, you know, happening in mass. And so I, I met a lot of independent scouts um, who were grinding away, doing their part in the game, connecting with a person here or there, trying to give them the little bits of information they collected but it was, there was nothing really organized or, or coordinated in terms of a scouting effort beyond, you know, what U.S. soccer does um, in terms of youth ID for, for national team work. 
there really is nothing of the scale of what we're trying to accomplish at the soccer syndicate in this country. Um, and so, so that was something that I felt was, was clearly missing in the game. Um, and again, I had uh, a unique experience and skill set to, to take forth with that and, and give it a shot. And, you know, we've had, you know, pretty good success in our first five years, you know, we're, uh, Five years here in August, uh, the, we officially launched. We we launched a few months before, privately putting the the business together. But but we launched publicly five years ago, um, at the start of the college season. So we're, this is our five year anniversary right, right now, um, and we've had great success, you know, domestically between MLS and USL clients, um, and and helping clubs identify players that they've either drafted through the MLS uh, Super Draft signed in you know and brought into the youth academies um you know we've, we've we've signed high school players into usl um we've had a, a tremendous amount of success at different levels with different clients um and, and the feedback has largely been you know really great in terms of the work that we do and so we're, we're really proud of that uh, we hope to keep building um and, and moving forward and, and trying to really stabilize ourselves long term uh, in terms of what we can provide our clients and and our our space in, in the industry so nice yeah congratulations on the five years that's ex that's exciting and very impressive with saying that do you guys have any um strong relationships with the u.s federation or uh, any of the leagues or clubs in place partnerships or strategic partnerships yeah um you know, I'm, I'm very friendly with the talent ID department in U.S. soccer. I, I was a candidate for a role there a uh, long, long time ago, probably um, not that long, maybe five years ago, right before I launched this company. I thought about maybe going and working there. Um, so I know those guys well. I'm not sure that what they're doing and what we're doing sync directly, but but we're, we're certainly in communication. Um, in terms of league partnerships with within MLS or – or USL, we're not really, I'm not really there at that, at that, at this point to go in that direction. I'm still trying to make sure we build out individually with the clubs that rely upon us um, and, and build that, you know, that, that um, you know, build a strong base of clientele before we would sit down with the league and say, do we want to transition this into a, or any of the leagues rather, to transition into a full partnership with, with a full league um you know I, I think we look at our service right now as a um something that the cl clubs that use can use as a strategic advantage um and kind of positioning ourselves in that way and eventually we hope that the there'll be a groundswell where every club will will want us and, and we can just do a partnership deal that kind of wraps up that relationship pretty pretty seamlessly but but we haven't we haven't reached that genesis yet um yeah, and so you know, our, our, the clientele we do have, I think, uh, again, like I said, are pretty happy with with the work that we we provide them. You know, nice. So, you know, why would clubs, professional clubs, specifically want to work with you guys instead of you know getting their own scouts and doing their own thing? Sure. So, so our our scouting company is strictly domestic. So we we scout here on this soil. Uh, you know, United States, we, we do have some work uh, being done in Canada, still trying to build up our Canadian staff a little bit stronger than where we stand today. But our focus is primarily in those two regions. And I would say that, you know, domestically here in the United States within M MLS, the focus has not been to build a domestic scouting staff amongst clubs. Uh, you know, the MLS territory rights and the rules that have been in place you know, that protect youth ID and, and youth transfers within the country um, has been dissuaded. And so the, the focus to build a domestic scouting staff hasn't been there because you really can't go and take players from other parts of the country. So as long as you have your regional coaches and, and you know, maybe a handful of guys assisting in the, in the town ID department within your territory, you can really manage it with a small, a small staff. Um, you know, and and I'd say years ago when I became a Kansas City staff member, the focus on college, you know, back in 2013 was incredibly uh, important because the college player was still a major um, funnel for players coming into the league. That, you know, that 
landscape he, almost 10 years later now uh, is much different in the sense that um, not as many players go into the MLS uh, in, into the MLS from the college system as it used to. So I think a lot of clubs don't think the investment of building a full staff to scout the country is worth it to them for what it would cost versus what the return would be. Um, so there, ergo, they can hire our service for a fraction of that cost um, and get the information they need. And so, so the clubs that we work with see that value and decide to, to go that route with us instead. Um, so our, our work is we, we compile information at all different levels of the game, whether it be youth, college, lower divisions, and then we contracted out the pieces of the of the data set that each club wants, and and every club. Work. I don't think there's one club that who has a mirroring relationship to another club uh, with us. Everyone has some different carve out of what they collect, what information they want to collect from us, and and our relationships are all you know kind of constructed uniquely to to fit the needs of of each individual club. Understood. That's amazing. I'd love to see more behind the scenes offline. Um, if you can, with saying that, uh, I want to go back a little bit. Was there any, um, is there a specific, specific criteria in regards of getting your, is there a scouting license that you need to get or anything along those lines back in time? And has it changed now? To work with us. Um, no, to get your license. Is there a license that you even need to get to be a scout in the U.S.? No, there's, there's no official requirements. Um, needed to be a scout in this country. Uh, uh, U.S. soccer has put together some courses on, on scouting, and there are quite a few independent uh, companies that, that do scouting courses. You know, I'm a big believer, and, and maybe this is just because of the route I took and the path I came from, is that I don't, I'm not particularly concerned with where you came from and how you came up. I'm more concerned about work product and, and your passion and your at, you know, your drive to see players and, un and understand and, and learn. Um, be, you know, ultimately, I tell future scouts and scouts that uh, people who are interested in scouting, you're as good as the players you've seen, right? And you're as good as the, you have the ability to analyze those players against other players you've seen previously. Um, you know, and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, obviously, there's, there's certainly more, you know, you know, as you, as you rise up and you, you want to learn more, you need to understand the technical, you know, jargon and, and, and how to describe a player and, and analyze that player in terms of what their strengths and weaknesses are. But ultimately, if you're not out there pounding the pavement and seeing players live and, and understanding the, the landscape in pieces, I mean, just doing what we do here as a domestic scouting company in the United States, it is tremendously difficult to scout the entire youth system and then other areas on top of that college system all together and know it well. I mean, I'm over, you know, 12 years into this business and I don't think I know, every, I don't, I'm certain I don't know everything that I need to know to be incredibly, you know, uh, you know, a, a one-stop shop uh, of, of all the talent in this country. Um, and so it takes a long time to build, you know, your understanding, your knowledge base, your contact list, you know, and so the scouts that we work with, we build, so, you know, first off, we're, we're all regionalized, right? We, we, we contract scouts in specific regions of the country that network their, the information they see locally into our greater system um, so that we, we carve out much of the travel of this country, which is what makes scouting incredibly expensive. Um, so, so in building the scout, helping the scout develop, we focus them uniquely in their area first. Understand your area, soup to nuts, all the players around there, and then we build them out into other parts of the country and, and, and other segments of the game, if you will. If we start them in youth, we'll move them into another area later on um, and, and try to build up stage by stage. And then, you know, we help them along the way in terms of, you know, this is the good parts that we're seeing about, you know, what you're producing to us in terms of, uh, you know, player reports and whatnot. This, these are areas that we think could improve. You know, when we, when you know we do cross checks on players that you know our senior staff know quite well, and say, okay, evaluate this player. 
And then if there's concerns, we, we'll sit down. So how did you come to this conclusion about where this player fits? Uh, because we were not really seeing the, the same out of that player from our experience. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's some measurements in terms of, do we think that, you know, ultimately as a scouting team, we want to make sure our scouts are all looking through the same lens, right? A, a scout on one part of, in one part of the country, you know, on the West Coast versus the East Coast, when they look at a player, that lens is the same. And that's really the, the key to the strength of the scouting staff is that your, your entire staff understands, you know, you know, a grading system and that that grading system matches and that players, um, you know, are all being seen through the same lens and, and that when you give a, when five reports are delivered from five different scouts, the, you know, we're, we're evaluating those players in this under the same lens and ultimately are ranked uh, appropriately. So it's, it's a, quite a bit of work to, to get that system in place, but, you know, we've been at this for quite a long time and, you know, the, the, at least from a senior staff perspective, we feel very confident that our group um, does does pretty good analysis, and I think our clients have have given us that feedback that they're they're happy with the work we do. So nice off topic question. I have a buddy, um, a good buddy of mine, Jalen Campbell, that just graduated from Temple University, played soccer his whole life, like eighteen years. Uh, yeah. That's interested in scouting. Are you guys currently hiring or anything like that, or looking for people? Um, is Jalen still in Philly? Uh, no, he's back in Canada. Okay. Um, that's where he, that's where his residence is Canada. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, uh, we're always interested in, in new talent. So the answer is yes. Uh, and then now it would be, I can talk to him and just see if there'd be a fit. I actually, uh, one of his former teammates, uh, worked with us as our director of communications for quite a long time. So, um, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to talk to him and, and see if, you know, what type of games he thinks he can get to see. And, um, you know, we've, again, as I said before, we'd love to build up uh, a stronger staff in, in the Canadian market. So uh, I'd be certainly open to talking. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, now, in regards to the system, I checked out the whole website on uh, Soccer Syndicate. Um, in regards of, you guys have a player uh, database, correct? We do. Yeah. And that's, um, how many players do you guys have in that database and is it publicly act is it is there access to the public or is that just like private to you guys uh it's a so it's private we don't give that we don't give access to anybody so when we carve out information for our clients we go into the database per their parameters and we pull out the information and we send it to them so nobody has access to the full database outside of our our internal staff um uh so yeah it's not viewable by the public in terms of volume of reports, so our college database, which again we started, you know, more than a decade ago, even before the soccer syndicate existed, um, when myself and some of the scouts who work with us now were working for clubs, you know, all that data that we developed back then, you know, we owned that data when we provided it to the clubs that we worked with back in the day. So all that information is there. So I would say we have. 100,000 reports maybe in, in the college space over a decade. Um, uh, I don't know. That might be too many. You know, yeah, what, like, I, don't know, I haven't looked at it in a long time in terms of volume. I, my One of my partners is responsible for managing the database, so he'd know better these answers. Uh, in terms of others, youth, um, I would say, you know, quite a few, 10,000 probably, I think is fair. Um and then lower division, maybe 5,000, um, you know, so that's, uh, yeah, I mean, our, our databases are, you know, pretty robust. Again, college has always been our bread and butter for a long time. I think now with, with college players mostly transitioning into USL and our USL clientele um, expanding pretty rapidly, I think that just is going to continue um, that, that the college space is going to continue you know, be one of our, our biggest revenue generators in terms of our evaluation and the work that we do. Youth is still um, emerging in a lot of ways through all the client spaces, but but I think, you know, we're putting much more energy into the youth space now than we ever have before, um, just because I think that's where, you know, if, if we can have some success in that space, that's where the big money 
um, can be, I think, in terms of the growth of our business moving forward. For sure. Um, with, you know, I want to have a better understanding of how you guys secure the players and collect the data. Um, are you guys approaching these, like, for example, let's say a player 16 underage, are you guys approaching the parents to connect with the player and how are you guys securing it and then collecting that data? Uh, so that, that is a little bit, you know, unique, right? I think we try to pick our spots. Um, I try not, I personally, I think all of our scouts are different in terms of how we handle it. Some of my scouts are very aggressive when they see a player they like in terms of going to introduce everybody, you know, and, and get, you know, whether it be through the coaching staff or through the family, trying to collect as much information as possible. For me, I'm more, uh, you know, we need to have a vision in terms of, you know, this kid's got to have, so, you know, something that we can impact them with pretty soon um, for us to, for me to move into, let's start talking because I think that opens up a can of worms that you don't want to open unless you, you know, you're going to take it somewhere. So, I, I tend the elite kids I find are more aggressive in terms of trying to collect their information, understand what it is they're trying to accomplish. I mean, what's what's interesting about our service, and I think kind of the, another part of the genesis of why we felt we needed to start it is when we worked for an individual club, we would identify players that we liked all the time. But the reality was, is let's say even in the best of days within Sporting Kansas City, when there was youth academy you know, full park rangers, which was the reserve side name. Now it's SKC2 and the first team we're looking within a 12, a uh, 12 month cycle, one year, maybe placing on a, you know, in a good year, 15 players in the country into the system at all levels, you know, you know, maybe a couple of, you know, two draft picks to the first team back in the day when, when draft picks still made first team rosters, another three or four, you know, into the reserve side, uh, and then maybe a handful of academy recruits, you know, so let's say a dozen players total on, on a good year. We're identifying way more talented players than 12 in a season. And so the challenge was, it's like, all these kids are like, we need help finding the space and, and we don't represent the players at all. But the, but the reality is that a lot of players benefit from the work that we do in terms of syncing them up to a, a potential opportunity in a trial or what have you because the club is motivated to find players that they, they can't find on their own. But we were, we were leaving so many talented kids on the side of the road because there was nothing we could do with them um, with the one with the one we worked within. Um, this model helps us in terms of I, the players we identify making more love connections, if you will, um, you know, in terms of finding linking a player with a pathway that is of interest to them. And so when we do end up talking to families, it's really about understanding what's the path that they want to, they want to travel, you know, and as we grow and as we add international clubs and whatnot, you know, that's, that's a piece of the pie as well in terms of, you know, there are definitely families in this country that don't much care to, to keep their, their son here playing in this, this country would be more than happy to move them abroad for the right opportunity and um, and, are, and oftentimes just lacking that opportunity or, or that connection. Um, and so I think for us, it's about understanding what realistically they want to do. Um, you know, you're, in the youth area, you're seeing top youth players either decide, am I signing homegrown with the MLS team that I'm, I'm playing for? Do I get into an MLS Academy system so that I could potentially sign there? There are some kids who have been playing in MLS academies for years saying, I don't, I don't want to sign here. I don't think it's the right fit for me to sign here. I'm going to sign a USL first team contract. And that's now happening, you know, where there's a half dozen kids every year doing that. Um, so there's so many different pathways and it's understanding what pathways that the family and the player thinks is right for them. And also which pathways they even consider. Um, and so learning that, that type of information, um, I think, is what we try to gather for our clients, right? Like, we can say, this kid's really good, right? We think he'd be a great fit for what you're looking for. But if we don't know if they actually realistically entertain an offer from the client we're recommending to, you know, it, if we don't have some understanding of that, that they'll at least listen, if we're presenting good players all, all day long, but none of them want to go to the club we're working with, 
then we're still not truly. I, I'm not sure our club clients would be that happy if we're like, well, yeah, if you're identifying great kids. This is awesome, but nobody wants to play here, so, or aren't looking for our pathway as the right path. So we try to get as much information as we can in that space to to make sure that we're trying to fit the pieces of the puzzle together as many different fits as there can be. So. Yeah, great point, Scott. With saying that, um, you know, very valuable points. I see the value in the service that you guys are providing. I apologize for that time up there. Zoom's trying to squeeze us right now. I don't have the full plan. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, with saying that as well, um, you know, with One Soccer Nation, this is, a, you know, a great service for what we're about to do and bring it to life. Um, and the last thing I do want to mention is, was there anything that you wanted to add in um, before the video cut, cuts out? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, no, I mean, not right now. I, I think, you know, for me, if there, you know, if you have, I don't know what you're following and how many people are going to watch this, but I would imagine it's um, quite a few young people who are passionate about the game. And, you know, if, they're, if they do have interest in scouting or, you know, have always wanted to, to learn more about it, you know, and, and think that there could be a fit there. Again, I, I'm not concerned about where you came from, where what your background was. It's more about, again, your willingness to watch the game um, and, and not, you know, there are a lot of people who are passionate about watching the game, but it's when it's, you know, Barcelona versus Man City, you know, this is not that. This is, you know, much more grassroots, a lot of youth soccer, a lot of, you know, small time college games that, that at times are not very attractive, not very sexy, but there's a, a certain <clears throat> excitement you get out of identifying a player that, you know, no one else knows about. You know, I, I went to a place I went, as I was telling you before we logged on here, went to a college game last night. Um, and there was a, a freshman in one of the games that I, I'm certain nobody knows about, but to me, he's an MLS prospect for sure. Um, first game fresh or, second, probably second game of his freshman year um, is a player that I, I think I, I will need to watch a lot more of because I think he's got a big a big chance to, to do some things. Um, and, and I know there's nobody else out there that's onto him yet. I feel very confident about that. And so it's, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. This isn't an everyday scenario, but it does happen occasionally. And, and knowing that I'm first to identify um, is gives me excitement and keeps me pushing when I'm going to, you know, when there are games, I'm sitting there going, there's absolutely nobody here. And I'm questioning whether or not I'm going to stay past halftime, you know, and, and, and that's the business, you know, it's, you're by yourself, you're on your own. Um, and, and it takes a certain passion and personality to, to want to chase it. So I think that's, you know, if someone's listening to this and they have interest, you get to ask some of those questions to yourself first is how, how bad do you want it? Because it's not, it's not sexy all the time. A lot of it's, grind and and unfun and you know three i was three hours plus on the road each way last night for a two-hour game um and and that's the type of work you do you know you have a 10-hour day and only you know 90 minutes of that is, is soccer so um you know you just gotta think about how bad you want it and, and if this is the, the industry you want to be in because it's it can be grueling at times got it I'll have everything for the soccer syndicate link and uh, down in the description below, guys. Um, with saying that, Scott, very quickly, I just want to, um, I want you to share like the short-term goals of the company really quickly. I want to ask you the last ten fun questions that are speed questions. Okay. Uh, short-term goals are to, um, uh, you know, make sure you know, rebuild from COVID uh, the the domestic client base that, you know, is our sustainable model moving forward. You know, uh, COVID was a difficult time in which a lot of clubs were looking to cut needless expenses and, and outside contractor services was certainly one of those. Uh, and so rebuilding, the, you know, the base that we had prior to that, I think is, is my number one focus right now. And, and we're certainly seeing that trajectory on its way back to, to where we need it to be. So, um, yeah, that, that's the short-term goal right now. Nice. And to wrap it up, I have 10 fun questions. Okay. The first one, who is your favorite team? Uh, the teams whose check arrive on time. Sorry, what was that? Uh, the, the teams whose check 
arrives on time. Since okay, the- got it. <laughs> uh, favorite player? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I'm not sure I have an answer. That way. Uh, gosh, give me. Let's keep going. Maybe I'll come up with that by the end of the questions. I'm sorry. Favorite, favorite cleats? Uh, Adidas. Favorite food? Um, oh, pizza. Favorite artist? Musically? Uh, John Legend. Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. Who's, uh, would you rather score two? Actually, let me forget that one. Uh, all right, th- that, that was the last fun question. These are like soccer fun questions. They're player okay. Sorry, I didn't tell them properly. No problem. That's all right. All right, awesome. Scott, um, before we go, I just want to thank you for taking the time for joining us on the One Soccer Nation podcast today. All right, sounds good, man. Take care. Thanks. You too.